Okay. Hopefully the shit works. Yeah, so back in 2011, when I was 11, I started playing the trombone. And I had always had some sort of musical exposure in the past. I'd mainly done choirs and just the forced school choirs, but I always went extensive with them and I did extracurricular activities after school in regards to music. I really enjoyed broadening my understanding of what music was and how I could actually manipulate it whenever my teachers would bring in some sort of keyboard or whatever. I'd always really enjoy fucking around with it. Over like a few years after I learned the trombone, I started learning the guitar and it was easy to just sit down and play my guitar and sit down and play my trombone and sit down and sing or whatever, but it was very difficult to come up with any original melody line, any form of chord progression. I just didn't understand how to visualize harmonies until I realized that visualizing something came from looking at sheet music and seeing that black and white structure actually become beautiful sounds that you very much enjoy was not something that I was comfortable with or even understood how anybody could come to a sense of comfort around that. And one of the main things that just kept on ticking me off a little bit was whenever I would like play my guitar or play my trombone or sing, there was always variations in the way things sounded and nobody would really address it. Right, if I played an E flat on my trombone, it should sound the same as an E flat on my guitar or on my voice, but it just doesn't. There's a lot of variations and a lot of artifacts that go into those unique sounds. Understanding those tones and recognizing that those are different than what the music is actually representing, as well as being able to be perceived differently by the audience, is wildly important. It's why we always hate those shitty covers whenever someone pulls up with a guitar and randomly plays a stupid pop song that does not have any acoustic instruments in it whatsoever. I was only taught those abstractions and so I decided to take my own course of development and that was in terms of music production because that's exactly what music production is. You know, taking something that you know, an idea or a sample or whatever the fuck it is and developing it further, producing it further. Getting into production was kind of easy because I already had a big background of technical ability with music tech and digital tech. Um, my siblings had always left around audio gear and so did my parents just in the sense of what they would use to listen to things. And I would always like breaking down cassette tapes and just figuring out how things were actually being recorded and how things were being translated from analog to some sort of output or rendering that doesn't really make sense unless you're given the direct instructions from a cassette tape itself. Um, cause you know, you can't just put in a CD to a cassette player and have it play the same thing. And that makes sense, but it only makes sense because somebody built it out of nothing. And that nothing is a very weird space to sit in. And I'd like to know how to get from nothing to a cassette uh, essentially, or whatever the fuck, you know, that's just an analogy. I started off just getting like a $70 guitar from Amazon and a Scarlet solo. And so I would record myself playing into like Fruity Loop Studio and Logic Pro and shitty cracked versions of them. Um, and I just enjoy making these big open spaces like everybody would, these soundscapes, and it'd be fun to toy around until I'd get into these weird roadblocks where the way my chord progressions would sound, the way my melodies would sound, the way everything musically sounded would be heavily affected by the types of tones that I would be deciding to use. And those changes weren't necessarily static. They weren't always the same given the same conditions. It's not that if I always changed my guitar to a liquidy tone or added a chorus effect to it whenever I was climbing down chromatically, it would have the same effect on the listener, but it also depended wildly on everything around it, the context. And this sort of made sense when I looked at it through the lens of sound design and recognized that there's a whole world of people who figured out that the audience, the person who's playing it, and the music that's being represented are actually three separate entities. They're completely different from each other, and they can all function in very unique ways while still having the exact same output. And that's the ideal circumstance, right? Is to have something that we can all agree is valuable, but we all have these unique ways of getting there, and we're all in this age of sharing our stories and all these weird things, and this isn't one of those, but it's a human thing to have different approaches to attaining satisfact like satisfactory results. The issue is that now I can say those things, but years ago I couldn't say those. A few years ago I had to take on a pursuit in order to figure out why people even cared about sound design or synthesizers or this weird analog to digital 
like spectrum of what you can do if you develop something in the analog wor world versus the digital world because of the way digital technology communicates with itself and the way analog technology communicates with each other. Just getting lost in it requires abandoning pretty much everything prior because in the digital world and in a lot of the production world, there's no sense in attaching it to reality unless you also very much understand the physical world, which is something I sought out to do and develop to some degree, but sitting in the abstractions really took a greater hold on me. But in those synthesizer world by, you know, just using like free synthesizers and old gear and all the shit that I had, I recognized that everybody was daunted whenever there would be these unique conditions or starting conditions using unique pieces of gear that wouldn't function together and adapting them together to use certain control voltages or just random things that could connect each other. Um, having a similar output or having uh, accidentally using a hi-hat to sidechain your bass, creating like the pulsing effect. And because of that, you decide to throw in kicks and it ties together a beautiful synth wave song or whatever those outputs may be. They always come from these rare starting conditions. And I feel like in my life, I've always come into those rare conditions constantly and have these outputs that are just a myriad of connections from wild things that I've been able to connect from brute exposure. I was a multicultural kid growing up. I had a wider range of athletic ability as well as a wider range of musical ability. And while those two never connected, I did acknowledge that both of them were human things. And so I sat in this world of human observation and trying to figure out exactly what it was that people responded to. And I realized that there is no exactly what it was. There's no one thing that people respond to. It's just a wide range of things that are capable of warranting a response. And when they do, and it's the same response from wildly different things, they happen to be more interesting than unique responses. Um, and that's just my opinion at the end of the day, but that's the output that a lot of people have been searching for, or at least told me they were searching for. And this could be just my age group that I'm exposed to and shit like that, but I'll never know until I'm older. So we'll just wait until I'm older to debunk that um, instead of doing it here randomly. That being said, uh, a little bit ago, I decided just to abandon everything that I knew and reconstruct the musical world that I thought I understood from scratch. And not to say that I understood it poorly or incorrectly or that other people do, but that there's a way for me to understand it that might be more in tune with how I want to approach the way that I learn other things and the way that I can use my ability in music, not just as a creative indulgence, but as well as a procedural indulgence, because I don't consider myself a creative person. I just think I have a refining process that works better than most to the point where if somebody was to say that it's creative that Pink Floyd was using phasers on their guitar or whatever, right? Me using it now doesn't necessarily make me a creative person, but if I know how to tweak it beyond Pink Floyd's ability, then maybe there's a certain level of compensation that can happen in the way that an audience might be satisfied to hear my words. Shit, speaking is so fucking hard. Uh, and that's why I did the seven albums in 2021 was to try to really give evidence to the things that I had come up with. And so I tried to do everything from scratch and I did very well. I tried to have as many one takes as I could so that there was a raw amount of thought coming out because the most important thing about theories that I learned honestly over the course of the year is that they're not rules. They're just things that we've noticed. They're observations. Ultimately, if you know that climbing down chromatic chromatically in a chord sounds a specific way, it'll never not sound that way. And that's a good thing. That's a nice thing because it's a hold on something. It's a pivot point that we can use in order to make more interesting and dynamic music as long as we attach those points of reality. And that was another lesson that I got to learn was how to be intentful with all the music that I had and at least try to be intentful in the sense of placement and dynamicism and the way that it would try to be perceived by an audience and how somebody might further indulge the music and analyze it and being sure that any plot holes they run into, plot holes, uh, will be filled in by what was prepared prior. So the wide range of mediocre songs and average production just ultimately is a little bit of evidence of what I was capable of doing, but I don't know. It's shit. It's just like 760 songs. What? It's shit. It's seven albums, 60 songs. Yeah. Yeah. So 
So Underwater Can't Survive was sort of supposed to be a step into creating real life and music together, even though it was poorly done and I didn't accomplish my goal at all. It was just something that I hadn't tried before and now I have tried it. Um, though I was trying to use real life photos and real life lyrics, real life stories to impact it, but I suck at lyric writing. I'm not a photographer and that was the songs that I did. I just knew some blue scales and I knew how to do some production work in the sense of indie rock, but nothing truly beyond that except for an understanding of how these tools that I was using to make indie rock could be used for other things. So the first song was pretty fun. It was nothing special. It was just a good vibe that I had. I didn't really produce songs like that before and so having wider vocals was a good thing to try to attempt because a lot of today's music in my mind tries to go for wide vocals and so if I ever try to work with people on shit then I have an example of my ability to work on that. Feeling Down was also a very wide song. I tried to focus on the stereo imaging of that using a lot of chorus effects and actually automating the direction mis mixer so that there's a difference between the verse and chorus and the way you see and hear the oohs and ahs and whatnot just for the ability to prove that I did it. Happy to Stay is forcing myself to write lyrics in ways that I'm not comfortable writing lyrics. Um, almost rapping, but in the sense of rhythm and poetry, trying to have an intentful rhythm and intentful words going into it, but not rapping because there's melody over it, and I don't think that that counts, but maybe I'm wrong and I don't care if I am. I want a real bass. I don't own a real bass. Everything that I do that sounds like a bass is just my guitar pitched down, and I just figured out really early on how to create a really good patch that sounds like a pretty groovy bass, and that's all you hear. I, d I don't own a bass. Something bad is happening inside of me is more an experimental thing. I want to do some synthesizer work as well as focus on how I can make a percussive or feeling, like a rhythmic feeling with the synthesizers instead of percussive elements so that the song can continue to drive on, but I wouldn't actually have to try to focus on how to make it drive on. and. That's nice and shit. Hell look, uh, it's just a, a groove. I had a drum kit that I recently got, the Alesis, like Nitro Mesh or whatever the fuck it's called. Um, and I didn't know how to play drums. And so I learned how to play that groove basically. And then I did it. And I tried to throw in some snares and be like, well, look at me throwing in ghost notes, ghost notes. And yeah, that's what happened. Uh, Self-Indulgence is I my favorite song off of this album. It's the one that I think is the most quality made. Fuck, speaking is hard. Yeah, uh, it's okay words. The tone of the song matches my voice the best, and I kind of took note of that to try to maybe pursue for my lack of ability in vocal work and thinking if I can focus on something that I'm comfortable with, then I can improve that and take it into areas that I'm not comfortable with, which makes a lot of sense. So after the first album, I noticed that things weren't really congruent and so I had a higher objective of trying to make everything flow better and it happened, the album happened and so that's just that. Uh, I didn't really get the objective is what I'm trying to say. I had a couple of songs that I started working on when I was working on the first album that I had more time to work on because I gave myself that time uh, in order to create a better fleshed out uh, version of my work essentially in the second album so that it could sort of be like, hey, even if this is the uh, amount I could have done in this time, while this was happening, I was doing something better, hopefully, so that it's not always a static thing, that there's a fluidity to as well, to, to there's a fluidity as well to the work that I'm doing. So I wanted to get my production speed a lot faster on this one because it had taken me a week to really finish the first album because I had a lot of the songs already prepped, but it took me a few months to create, produce, mix, record, all of it um, for the second album. And I tried to have more songs on this one, even going through a theme that like goes into three parts. And I'll, like, well, we'll talk about it in a second, I guess. Um, I used a artwork from a friend of a friend who likes to photograph and film and so I was trying to have this collaborative aspect into it which made me realize that maybe if my production got quality enough I could use it as a collaborative aspect and that was a fun little takeaway that was outside of music on the second album but anyways the first song possibly possible themes part one or whatever uh, it's a wavy jazz intro and I was trying to experiment with different genres also to open up the uh, sort of space that the entire album was going to sit in which was a little groovy but also chorusy and sometimes just sat in its own like soundscape. The second song is a song like that, the sat in its own soundscape, a lot of digital sound design, um, a heavy synthesizer, a pad that I like to use quite frequently. It has a lack of percussion which was another thing because I don't think that I quite nailed how to make 
all these instrument tracks actually drive forward without these percussive elements and I really want to figure that out. I think that's an important thing and um, eventually I'll, I think I did but I haven't yet at this point. Reset My Mind, the third track, it's an okay groove. I was getting a lot of inspiration from hers, a lot of those types of tones and so that, that was that. Power switch, I just, just I like the idea of interludes and having things almost feel like an opera, like when you're sitting in a theater and actually getting something presented to you and they have to take a break. Um, Shades Above is then after the interlude and it's just this digital, almost like EDM song, a disco song, some shit like that, but it's not at the same time and so we're not gonna classify it as such. Possible Themes Part 2 is just a continuation of Possible Themes Part 1. Um, kind of same instrument, same vibe, uh, to, just to, to flip up the album, make it feel like it is connected, but also to stop you so that it can act as a palate cleanser in some ways. Um, Lock Manic, uh, I had worked on this song for a while. It was using a lot of electronic drums and a lot of electronic samples, but as in I was recording my samples and then altering them digitally just so that I could see what would happen if I tried to nail down specific tones and frequencies from unique sounds, which is just a, a basic producer step, but I hadn't really done it yet. And so I got over that hump and that was honestly very rewarding and it made sense why people take time to do this type of shit. Lock Depress was supposed to be the antithesis to Lock Manic, a little bit more slowed down, a little bit more depressing and lost, but it's also just like a little jazzy, wavy thing, and that's kind of the theme for the album. What Happened is another soundscapey thing of using my acoustic guitar, and I like hearing a lot of voices slow down, and that was a thing that I was trying to avoid a lot over these albums, but I just couldn't because it's, it's something that I've been doing since. I was a kid and ever since I could record my voice and slow it down, it's just what the fuck I like doing. Um, Possible Themes Part 3 is just the closer, uh, just a, a, a little solo, it's fun, it's fun, that's it. So for Banana Bird Bandit, I wanted to take a higher quality production approach. I didn't want to have this indie rock vibe that I was really stuck producing. I wanted songwriting to become a lot more fluid in the sense of making sense with the titles, making sense with everything that I was creating, making sense with the artwork as much as I could, which didn't really pan out, but I wanted the intent to at least be there. Um, and so I tried to revamp the way I was doing things, focusing a lot more on the just writing out like scores and stuff because I was just writing guitar parts and then figuring out things that could complement it and instead doing the opposite, right? Writing out these digital synth parts and then figuring out guitar parts that could complement it and then stacking my vocals on top still, which was a big issue because at some point I wanted my vocals to be the main thing and to be able to write everything off of those vocal lines would have been fantastic. Uh, the artwork was fun to create and the monsters vibe that I have going through is a pretty fun thing. The intro for the demons is like a fun little jazzy thing. So the first song, Too Distracted, it's like almost hip hop, but also almost like alternative rock or so just Beastie Boys vibe, but then some like wide vocals on top because that's just the way I like to do my vocals. There's nothing too special about it. It wasn't anything but me throwing together different pieces to try to see how they would pan out together. And it didn't pan out poorly, but it wasn't my best work. Amber Moods was, uh, it just sounded like such a good idea in the sense that the like indie pop progressions that I had just sounded so fluid and so nice and but the vocals sucked and I had horrible lyrics. And I just didn't know how to actually do it. And what I had, the end result was just horrible and I spent way too much time on it. And I just had to put it in because it was what was planned and I couldn't really go back. And I found the caveat of planning things too far ahead, especially when you don't really know what you're gonna be able to do or sound like. And that also forced me to kickstart this idea of like, visualize the final product, really visualize it, understand how it's gonna sound and recognize that if you're not talented enough to do those things, you're just not talented enough, to, talented enough to do those things. You can get better, but you have to get better. You have to be at that point in order for those things to be there. And if you give yourself a timeline and you're not there, you're just not there. Enjoy for the Demons, little fun jazzy thing. I like soloing and that was a good thing to do. I came up with a few licks for that one. And so those were licks that I used later on in other songs and stuff throughout the albums. Banana Bread Bandit is the first song that's a monster song or whatever. So Banana Bread Bandit was like an observant thing, just, I don't know, no real point to it. Just a lot of electronic production because I needed to get that tightened. So I had a drawing of a random thing in my notebook and it looked like somebody staring out of it. Um, and when I tried to write a song, I had a 5-4 
chord progression that worked very well with me, 5-4 time signature. The track is kind of my first psychedelic track. It's, it puts you in your head a little bit. Uh, it's pulsing in equal ways, but it also has that like snare that keeps on popping in like a lot on its own. and that drives the song in a unique manner in my mind. Faceless Man is a really fun chord progression and I just have this like trap drum beat in the background just re looping um, on its own and it weirdly doesn't fuck up the song and my vocals going through feel like a nice vocal line and a unique enough vocal line that those artifacts that were coming in from like having a guitar being pitched up crazy high were almost adding to it. They were consistently hitting like these extensions on accident and it was finding another rare starting condition with this unique output that just felt ah, almost blessed. People watching is just like a very slow Thing, a laggy, almost drunk feel to it, and uh, that was just electronic production mixing it and trying to throw in elements that I just thought I wanted to hear at the time, and it really was what I wanted to hear, and sometimes I hate that song, sometimes I like it, and so far those types of songs have been the ones that I enjoy the most overall, in the sense that I'm the happiest with and I can recognize the amount of production I went into, and that's because if I really go into a direction, at some point I'm gonna recognize that I love going and fleshing out my entire life and if I'm sitting in a different pocket to really develop it, I'm not going to like every single other pocket that exists and that's just because not every audience and every group and every community is supposed to be like, you know, hand in hand with each other. There's supposed to be the unique aspects, aspects to everything. Aspects. The whole point of Moses talking to the burning bush is him talking to God and hearing these commandments and feeling like he has to take these observations and share them with the world. But there's theories that say that the bush he was in front of was the acacia bush and that acacia bush was filled with DMT and so he was tripping balls and that's just what he thought God was when he was tripping balls. And so that's what this perspective is from, the perspective of that bush putting in these images into Moses, but not really, like not in a direct sense, but if you could imagine that you're that bush and you're just having this information inside of this human being's brain, the songs kind of make sense in that way. Um, and so that was a big focus for this album was being intentful. And so I wanted to have very unique production style, very unique instrument choices, very different playing style. And I had something finally that I wanted, which was a new guitar that sounded better, cleaner, more in like intonation problems were just fixed on it. Um, and I also got a MIDI keyboard, which was a necessity because I didn't have one and I had to have one, but I had never really played the piano before. So I had to learn how to play the piano and that took way less time than I thought it would. And it's because the piano is built to be like the perfect abstraction for music. And so when you're rebuilding your musical concepts, having that tool is fantastic. And I recognize instruments as tools for the first time. That was a great thing because the tool that I needed in order to make music music was just right in front of me. I had all these different tools, a guitar, drum kit, shakers, uh, digital audio workstations, a MIDI keyboard, speakers, just things that gave me a wide range of analysis, but I still had to do those things. And so that's what the Bush Moses smoked was. I had all this raw information, but nothing to go through it. So maybe I'm the Bush that Moses smoked. It's just some hippie shit, you know? So the first song prior, prior parentheses intro, I just like fucking around with that. That's it. Fuck I'm Tired is a pretty kind of like boppy song. It just starts with some strings and some piano like booping everywhere. I liked having the kick drum panned left and right and like a very stereo drum kit and bass sounds and I kind of kept that up throughout other albums because having that center bass was so static and just exists everywhere and the wider the track, the, the more pleasing it is. It's just reality. Intro, the real intro uh, is a fun one. It kind of uses more songwriting techniques that I tried to stick to, talking about specific imagery, talking about specific like feelings and emotions, even if I'm not even sure what those feelings are, just saying, well, this doesn't sound like the thing that I was just talking about, so I'm not gonna do that. I wanna talk about the thing that I was just talking about to continue it and add a sense of fluidity and force my, like, kickstart my brain into holding on to those mantras. Edge of the Screen was a fun production thing. I used garbage can samples a lot of the time for the drum kit. Um, I had a fun like bass line that I was doing, and so that was me trying to figure out how to write other instrument tracks on my MIDI keyboard because I didn't just wanna learn 
learn how to play piano. I also wanted to learn how to think of everything in terms of the notes that was going to be played and understand that if there's going to be a bass with a wah sound and I'm doing things in fifth scales, right, jumping from one note and then the fifth above it and then a different note and then the fifth above it, um, I'm going to be hearing a certain thing, right? Like that's not different from other things that sound like that. And that's the whole point, right? A chair is on different from chairs. Yep. Hallucinations are made up. This one is more of a lyric focus as well as a fluid focus, I guess, if that's a term or a thing that I could say, because focusing on having a song flow all throughout the way that one was, wasn't very easy. And I had a bass line that I had to come up with that wasn't easy, um, but easy in the sense of easy to me, right? I wasn't able of coming up with things that quickly in this time span because I only had a few months to record and release this on the timeline that I was giving myself in 2021. Um, I love the way it panned out. I don't have much to say other than it's just like, I learned how to do wavy shit and I did it. Vacation red flag slash my mind was a bill for this. I had weird hip hop production that I just really wanted to fall into and that's what that is. And I don't know how to take it into the hip hop world and I figured out some ways and I'll make more videos about that later on. Uh, but this is that. Uh, Bright Night Might Always Win is kind of like an electronic production that uh, it's, it's just intense. It's just intense. That's just what I like. I like hearing this like very open saw sound and it just gave me more to focus on mixing and wider uh, like digital production that I wasn't really doing in the sense of trying to make synthesizer sound wide rather than just uh, putting stacks of effects that force them to be wide. Grime, indie rock song. That's it. This is an indie rock song. It's not even that good. The contrast, I tried to combine indie rock with more of the electronic production that I was doing. And so there's these boopy effects that I do. And that's so common in all of my songs to have like these boops just going off everywhere as part of the lead or part of the whatever that's going on, the, 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 the shit that's going on. After the contrast, it's just a continuation. Um, and uh, the worst part about all of these uh, songs and the continuations is I tried to make the entire album like super fluid but it delays after each song, like after and before each song. And so that's like fun, I guess. Hurricane Samantha part one is the beginning of the three part albums that ended off all of the seven albums. I really just wanted to be intentful with these three. And so this one, I had an idea of the album art of me holding a joint that was with golden rolling paper. And so that's what that is, is me doing that, but like that, um, with it just in the fucking album photo. There's just somewhere on the screen. Uh, I realized that in the past, I was way too focused on how my production was going to sound instead of focusing on how to make my production better in that moment with the lessons I had just been learning throughout the entire year. And so that's what a lot of this album is, is coming up with parts that I know I don't feel comfortable putting out there presenting and forcing myself to produce them into fuller tracks that I would be comfortable putting out and presenting. And I lucked out in hitting all of these marks um, in the way I was doing it. I was trying to have a personal perspective and more earlier rebellious the feel to it, an indie rock feel. This was the first one that I actually had a full uh, genre like going throughout the album and that felt very nice to hit after maybe seven months of trying to do that and then finally creating songs that were like that intentionally before they could re get released in December. Um, so the first track, the welcome track, is just uh, an organ feel. It's supposed to set up the themes as well as the entire like backed out of my head vibe that Everything is, and also an organ just sounds super dark and scary, so it fits the rebellious, angry vibe. Hurricane Samantha Part 1, the song, uh, it's a more upbeat version of what we just heard, and it's supposed to serve as like the flip, right? Is that you usually are calm when you're rebellious, but in the sense of, well, you don't like what's going around and things are confusing, there's not a lot against that. And so there's a lot of arpeggiated boops and beeps that are delayed and in this giant space, a, a drum beat that's electronic and static so that everything is pulsing the same way. It's a, a vocal, vocal line that's repeating its melody, a chord progression that occasionally changes but overall is the same. And the whole point is that the sounds themselves are being affected heavily but they keep on repeating and so it's a, a repetitive confusion that exists in reality. It's Not So Deep is like this indie rock thong, song, thong, 
song. I can do rock song. The cool thing about it is that I have a bass melody and I never tried to write a melody for the bass and actually have it be like a center for it. And so if you listen to it and hear the chorus, you can hear it. Uh, stuck in Bad Bossa, I was listening to a lot of bad, uh, or not Bad Bossa Nova music, but good Bossa Nova music. And I kept on writing Bad Bossa Nova music. And so that was that reflection of that. It was almost like a modern re rebellion when I was writing a lot of my lyrics based off of old, younger feelings. Um, so, yeah. This isn't your voice, it's emphasizing how much of my music exposure wasn't mine and trying to push forward through that. But it uses like the blue scales that I was like ultimately grew up on and ultimately like learned first on my guitar and took that further into music production. I tried to write more intensive guitar parts and more focus on how like these instruments could work together rather than how like the whole song progresses but it didn't really come out that way it's just some shit that got recorded tone deaf pop just sucks it's so bad that's it uh don't breathe it's almost like again that alternative rock hip-hop vibe i don't know what to compare it to but uh it's kind of nice so there's a fun line or like when the chorus comes in my left side of the ear, like the vocal track on the left side, just like slips into the mix and that was fun to do and try to focus on the fact that the stereo field can be affected on each instrument and not just as a whole when I, that was really just how I was looking at everything was as a whole and that's not a, a, a good, that's it. Just apply, it's just moving the beat with the instruments instead of the drums and it doesn't do it that well. But that was the whole intent for it. And so that's why there's a lot of cemolo effects, a lot of open spaces, and just like this the, the wispy e piano, like uh, the, the, the chorus effect. My psyche was departed to high school, uh, this indie pop jam that I had, and I just wanted it out and that's it. And it fit the, the description of the album, uh, that's it. And some, it was a lesson of, I had to spend a little bit more time, but I gave myself good time. We're getting Samantha part two. There's an accidental tattoo on the album cover. That's kind of funky and just like a little silly thing that happened when I was learning how to do Photoshop stuff and I didn't want to get rid of it because it was a dumb artifact, but it looks kind of nice. I wanted to focus a lot more on electronic production again, but with the same intense songwriting feel that I had. And so I moved away from the acoustic instrument sound choice and a lot of the songs are just like the guitar is only playing like a little bit of a rhythm part if anything and that's really the only acoustic instrument that I would use apart from my voice. I wanted to use my voice a lot more and I wanted to have my lyrics drive the songs a lot more and reflect what was happening and even you go into like very specific emotions or potentially malicious emotions and descriptions just to have a specific reaction. So closing off Moses part one was just, I had learned piano for the Bush Moses Smoked and it was just kind of reflecting that I wanted to present that even more to see how much further I developed and that was that. Closing off Moses part two is kind of that, but it's a slightly different, more upbeat scale. There's like these aggressive bass lines that flow through it and it's supposed to be me climbing towards uh, escaping like these weird, lawless life that Moses kind of had to go through without the commandments. Time Will Tell, just a good electronic pop song in my mind. Honestly, give it a listen. Yeah. Trying to force a switch, uh, experimental one. I tried to have, again, pulsating drums with an odd time signature, this one in 7-4. Like in Banana Bird Bandit, I had Scratch Goddess in 5-4, just a pulsing one with an odd time signature. but. This one has kind of like a storyline to it of you could have protected me, but I didn't protect you. And maybe that was the best thing just to let that be that. Um, and the like nice pads and wispy synths start to come in like uh, throughout this buildup. And then when the drop happens, you're just caught up in the, in the, in the groove of it all. Hurricane Samantha part two is the end kind of, of trying to force a switch. And out of this aggressive electronic song, when it slows down, it out of nowhere comes in with this really like wide and just sad synthesizer and that's it. But it's using the same progression as Hurricane Samantha part one, the song. And so that's why it's Hurricane Samantha part two. It uses some of the same lyrics, but not the entire way. And so it's supposed to show a progression of 
same body, same perspective, different time. HSP 2P2, Hurricane Samantha Part 2, Part 2, pretty self-explanatory. Structured the same, kind of an alt-rock song, kind of a hip-hop song, again, but I just like the hip-hop drums, and this one was just more focused on that groove rather than elements of repetitive sample nature that other hip-hop influenced songs were focused on in my um, discography. Don't care, I, it's just bad, but I don't care. Uh, the last album is actually by far my favorite album. It's the one that I think I spent the most time on. It's the one that definitely has the best vocal work, the best instrument work, the best arrangement work. Everything is so simple and because of that, it works well when it was just so intentful and impactful. Every time I threw in a guitar part, it felt like it added the groove that I wanted. Every time I threw in the drum part, it felt like it added the groove that I wanted. Every time I added the bass part, it felt like it added the groove that I wanted. And it was super fun to work on it. And it was exactly what I kind of needed after spending the entire year on all the other albums and not really finding anything new except for there's more out there than I know. And now this is saying, here's what I do know. And here's a great exhibition of what I do know. I do know how to write lyrics. I do know how to sing, kind of, just in the sense of, I know how to sing the vocal lines that I wrote. Uh, I know how to write guitar parts that are different from each other and unique enough to warrant being placed next to each other. I know how to write bass parts that are both static and direct as well as parts that can be used as melodic parts to drive the song even further and add just little funky things that the bass is capable of adding because of the funky bass feeling. It was good and to represent that I had to pull that out of my mind and so everything in the album has a sort of psychedelic feeling to it. Uh, there's just there's just uh, more about me represented through it. The first song, No More Reality, that's taking a lot of instruments and focusing on representing chord extensions differently through each instrument without actually playing the full chord extension that I'm imagining in my head or that would be written out on some sheet music. There's also a, just a great groove to it and simple melody, simple production, and with a lot of reverb dumped on it, you get this great space that everything just kind of flies through. Uh, uh, the lyrics are kind of good in my mind, and yeah, I like it. The second song, Hurricane Samantha Part 3, uh, is using the same chord progression in some areas as well as some similar chord progressions from the Bush Moses Smoked and kind of combining both. Um, the entire song is just a piano, drum kit, a couple of brass instruments, and then like this synth, the Maddie's Pad, I have it called, because it's just a very fun thing from an artist that I was inspired from called Maddie, and he's, he's pretty cool. I never met him, but I imagine he's pretty cool. Yeah, so it's just the third part of that, continuing that same thing of connecting the three albums in some weird way, but this one is a better exhibition of my drum playing ability, my piano playing ability, and my arrangement ability, because all of these parts were recorded in one take, and that was very nice. Cash In and Cash Out, it was supposed to represent kind of like the sounds of a casino, and that's how in my mind it was spelled in, it was like cash in, no, you know, like cash in and out. I was originally gonna do C-A-S-H-I-N slash O, so that could be cash in and out and you would read it as casino um, but I didn't do that and said I did cash in and out and the delayed guitar kind of sounds like slots going through the vocal work almost sounds like you're drunk and walking through a casino um, so that was the intent for it uh, yep steady pressure prelude it was just setting up the theme for a song that was gonna appear later on and I just wanted you to be able to hear what was gonna appear so that you could think of like the foreshadowing and recognize the entire album as a whole instead of just sitting through one song and having that. It also helps that all of the songs are just connected fluidly, like each song goes into one after the other and I've been doing that since the Bush Moses smoked. I Stay Stuck, it's another palate cleanser in the middle and just serving as uh, another wispy song that sort of is led by the vocals and led by the lyrics but not stuck towards the beats that it's playing. It has this weird wonky sample that's starting at the beginning and the whole point is that it's going to be weird enough and rhythmic enough that you're going to turn it into white noise and just tune it out and then there's more complex sounds going on top and it was sort of a cheat because it made the sounds that were really basic and simple and not at all well produced feel like they were filling out a lot more space just because there were these shitty samples uh, going in the background. HSP 3-2, Hurricane Samantha Part 3, Part 2. Self-explanatory again. Remember You're Not Real, another one where I focused a lot on the entire song. It's kind of like No More Reality. I had a lot of vocal work that went into it. I wanted to have 
different sections be very unique to each other, but only in the way that the instruments were playing, not in the way that the whole section would feel, because I was thinking about a lot of classical works and how there were these different like movements to them, but each movement still carried the same essence, and that was the whole point of having a composer write that. And I'm not comparing myself to a classical composer because that would just be fucking a dog shit argument. Uh, but I do have different sections that are playing different things, but they're using the same instruments under the same chords, but different chord extensions under those sections, and that's kind of cool. Steady pressure is just that whole thing, the better version of the Steady Pressure Prelude. The Steady Pressure Prelude was just like this piano track and now this is a more fleshed out version of it. It's kind of an attempt at scoring and so maybe that would be a future like investment that I could go into in a next pursuit for my musical endeavors. A bit closer, it is a bit closer to the end because it is and yeah, that was it.